Welcome back to Just Chatting. And these are the videos we do on Thursday nights for the entertainment of our YouTube community. Now, last week, we started taking a look, an admittedly speculative look, at what Nutmeg's end game is likely to be. And in order to do that, we have to take a look at the agenda that underlies everything that's been going on for the last few years in Nutmeg's sordid life. So, in order to do that, we have to deal with the fact that she aspires to be Diana 2.0, and she's been very open about that. So, we had to take a look at Diana 1.0, the original Diana, and we took a look at who she was uh, in her earlier years, when she was dating Charles, when they first married. Now we're going to take a quick look, because it doesn't need to be more than quick, at the Diana we all came to know later. And then we're going to see how that plugs in to Nutmeg's plans. So, when we come back. So last week, we took a look at Diana, a uh, young country girl. She was barely 20, and by that I mean a few days past her 20th birthday when she and Charles married. So she wasn't even a fully formed adult at that point. She was just a wisp out of her teens. And at that time, she was a shy, not very stylish country girl who just sort of radiated innocence and likability. Um, at one point, Charles said that she wasn't his choice. She was the nation's choice. He married her because she was the one the people liked. Um, quite possibly true. Uh, Diana, for her part, had later said that even when they were engaged, she wanted to back out, but her family said, hey, Dutch, your picture's already on the tea towels. It's too late for that. And she was compelled to go through with it. So the easiest way to deal with this whole Diana transition is let's take a look at Diana, and we're just going to do a little picture show. What we have here is Diana holding Harry in 1984. Very Victorian. Here, another shot, 1984. Not so Victorian, but still demure. Now we're coming up to 1985. Now we're seeing more of the Diana we're going to see later. Here again, 1986. Still the weird Victorian clothes from the early 80s, but more Diana. 1987, we have lost the subtle Victorian look and moved into something else. 1988, even more revealing clothing, more stylish. 1989, this is a great picture, very regal. Now we're looking at 1990. Um, she doesn't look happy in this picture, but still we're seeing a very stylish woman. 1991. Now she's looking happy again. Again, much more stylish. A 1992. Uh, this is an outfit Nutmeg likes because she's copied this color combination. 1993. We can see Diana's had some cosmetic dentistry and she's smiling broadly. Another from 1993 because this is another outfit Nutmeg has copied. This is the look she's going for. 1994, this is the so-called revenge dress, when her marriage was openly failing. 1995, 
This is from the Bashir interview. Diana as we remember her. 1996. This is Diana in what looks like a slip. I don't know. 1997, shortly before her death. This is the Diana we know and miss. So we've taken Diana from the point at which her marriage was in a state of free fall. And that would have been 1984, the year Harry was born. Diana subsequently said, and this is not Diana being quoted by someone else. This is Diana herself on video. And these videos were uh, filmed by her vocal coach, a man named Peter, uh, Peter what? Settling. Peter Settling. And the videos were made in 1992 and 1993. Um, it's very interesting that he retained the right to these videos, and it did go through the British courts. In the U.S., it's not likely to have worked out the same way, because as a vocal coach, he was Diana's paid employee, and the videos were part of the work he was doing for Diana. So it's much more likely that a U.S. court would have said that that work product belonged to Diana. And when the tapes resurfaced, they would have gone into her estate. But regardless, Settlin was declared the owner of the tapes and he sold them. Interestingly enough, we don't know if he sold them all. So there could be a few juicy little gems tucked away somewhere. Who knows? Nevertheless, back to the original point. Diana herself said that in 1984 and 1985, that two-year period, she was in love with someone else. And it's interesting. The timing is interesting because for the first nine months of that year, she was pregnant with Harry. And so, uh, awkward, I would say. It is widely believed the person she was in love with was Barry Manneke. And we will come back to Barry Manneke later. Given the fact that Diana was at that point, in her own words, in love with someone else, the marriage was, uh, it was done like dinner. All they were waiting for was dessert and the waiter to bring the bill. And that, of course, eventually happened. But what also happened in this period was a major transition. Diana had gotten married, produced the heir, produced the spare. Her husband uh, brought home baby number two. Uh, and that, I guess, is very telling about the marriage. Charles brought William to the hospital to pick up Diana and Harry, brought Diana the two children home, dropped them off, and went off to play polo. So, I'd say, yeah, the marriage was pretty much done by then, not just in Diana's eyes, but probably in Charles's eyes, too. But there was some desire to stay together. I'm sure it had a lot more to do with the royal family than anything Charles and Diana personally felt about the situation. Nevertheless, this marks the period of Diana's transition. So we saw her going from those weird 1980s Victorian get-ups, and that was the style in the early 80s. You know, we can't hang that on Diana's door. That was just how people dressed, what they looked like. And then we saw her just emerge as somebody very different. Somebody very urbane, sophisticated, strong sense of style. And the reason this is important is because this is the Diana that Nutmeg has fixated on. When she wants to be Diana 2.0, she is not talking about the shy little country girl. She is talking about the elegant and stylish Diana who was, well, not to put too fine a point on it, 
running around on her husband with just about anything not nailed to the floor, eventually divorced and making her own way in the world with her children. That's important because thus far, the media has all been focused on Nutmeg wants to be Diana in terms of the most photographed woman in the world. She wants to be a fashion icon. She wants to be a royal highness princess, blah, blah, blah. But does she really? And I would say no, because that's not who this version of Diana was. This version of Diana was a single mom breaking away from the royal family and striking out on her own. And that tells us a lot about Nutmeg's likely agenda. What is her end game? Well, Diana's end game was divorce the prince, keep the titles. She didn't keep her royal highness, but she was still princess of Wales. Uh, she had no claim on the throne, but she certainly had the two people next in line in her care and going off and becoming, um, well, Diana said that she was, she wanted to be perceived as a humanitarian. And we know that that is exactly Nutmeg's agenda. She throws the word humanitarian into virtually everything she says. I'm, I'm sure she gets the family up in the morning and says, let's go have a humanitarian breakfast. It's one of her favorite words. So I think, and again, speculative, this is my opinion. I think what we are looking at when we see Nutmeg is a woman who is not interested in a role within a marriage and within the royal family but far more interested in a completely independent role outside of a marriage and outside of the royal family. Now, I will admit this is entirely speculative, but I would say what we have to keep in mind is where Nutmeg and Harry settled when they left the UK. Now, for those of you in the U.S., this is old news to you. Go get a cup of coffee or whatever. This is for our friends overseas, particularly our friends in the U.K. It's probably very understandable that you look at our country and see it as, you know, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all, you know, just like our Pledge of Allegiance says. No, our country is actually 50 different states plus possessions, territories, commonwealths although I don't think we're allowed to say possessions anymore. I, I think we have new words for that. I'll have to go look them up. Each of those 50 states has its own laws. And although you, you can't go shoot anybody in every state, every single state is going to put you in jail for that. But, oh, even Texas, by the way, no matter what anybody tells you, it's not legal to shoot people in Texas. And by the way, the people telling you it is are probably Texans. Divorce laws is one of the areas in which states really vary widely. It used to be a much more broad diversity than it is today. But today with no fault divorce, it's, it's narrowed it a little. We have nine states in the United States that are what is called community property states. Now that means it's less than 20% of the country. California, as it happens, is one of those states. And what a community property state means is this is a state in which a person seeking divorce is entitled well, both parties, frankly, are entitled to one half of all of the marital assets. And that would include anything either party has earned during the marriage, anything they have acquired during the marriage, unless it can be proven that that act 
acquisition came from separate funds. In other words, grandma left them an inheritance and they bought a car. Since grandma's inheritance is usually not considered community property, the car they bought with it might not be. Keep in mind, I'm not an attorney. This is not legal advice. I'm just giving you a thumbnail view of what community property means. And case in point, you have a woman who's married to a man who just signed a $40 million book deal. Guess what? 20 million of that belongs to the little woman if she decides she wants a divorce or if he decides he wants a divorce. If he is earning this money, half of it is her money too. Now, to the best of my knowledge, Nutmeg and Ginger did not have a prenuptial agreement. And even if they did, I don't know if a prenuptial agreement drafted in the UK would meet the requirements of US law. What I do know is that if they divorce, they're divorcing in California, their state of legal residence. And that means nutmeg gets half. Now, there are a great many states where they could have settled. And very effectively, uh, New York, Miami, uh, Honolulu, and just states where there's a lot going on, uh, states with wonderful climates, you know, nice people, whatever. And in the past, we have been looking at the situation through the filter of Nutmeg's desire to continue to be an actress. She's not acting. She has not been acting since she and Harry got together. In fact, I think the only thing she did was a narration for a movie. Oh, and a podcast, if you want to call that acting. Now, I'm not going to let you call that acting, because if you call it podcast acting, you have to call what I'm doing acting. And trust me, the Academy is not looking to give me awards. This is not acting. So I think that we need to look at this through a different filter. Was she really out there to be hobnobbing with A-list movie people? Well, why would we think that? We would think that if she intended to continue her pursuit of an acting career. Looks now like she's looking at a political career. And where does one launch a political career from? Well, you know, Washington, D.C., if you want to do a lot of work behind the scenes, and New York, if you want to do it very publicly. It's, it's been that way for a long time. But, you know, Washington, D.C. and New York are not good divorce-friendly states. Oh, D.C., by the way, is not a state. That falls into that possessions commonwealth category that I mentioned earlier. So, are we really looking at settling in California as a means of uh, pursuing uh, her great love of drama? She doesn't need a stage to be dramatic. We all know that. She can be dramatic. The, the woman could be dramatic in a tent on a desert island. So, does she need L.A.? No. No. But she, isn't it interesting that this is where she's going to get the best divorce deal? Now, keep in mind, it's not just a question of California being a community property state. Do you remember this couple? Yes, this is Sandra Locke and Clint Eastwood. And in the late 80s, they had a very messy, very public, very contentious so-called divorce. So why do I say so-called divorce and give you the little air quotes? Because Sandra Locke at the time had been married to someone else for 20 years. By the way, she was still married to him when she died. So she actually had another husband took Eastwood to court for um, 
a division of assets according to the community property laws, alimony, a marriage settlement. Here's the thing. Most other states would not have even entertained that. They would have simply said the relationship is inherently adulterous. In some states that would have actually been illegal, but most other states wouldn't have even heard it. They would have said, even if they were going to hear a palimony case, in other words, uh, a cohabitation as a form of marriage case, they wouldn't have looked at this at all because there was no possibility that Locke and Eastwood could have married because Locke was married to someone else. By the way, when the smoke cleared, she walked away with a very nice settlement. So that just goes to show you that if you want a divorce, California is the place you go. Um, it's just the way it is. So I, and I don't know what it is about California. I'm assuming it's the sordid lives of all the Hollywood celebrities that just makes them very jaded about things like marriage. You know, there's an old joke. Uh, somebody at a Hollywood party says, we're celebrating our second anniversary. And everybody just runs up to them and says, oh, really, what's your secret? You know, because a two-year marriage is a big deal in Hollywood. So what we have to look at now is what makes more sense. Did she go to California simply because she wanted to be with her family? The same family she has disowned and won't speak to? Because she wanted to continue an acting career that she abandoned as soon as she met Harry? Or did she go there because this is a place where she can access half of all of Harry's wealth? Now, keep in mind, the British government, in their infinite wisdom, has helped this along a bit. Because by British law, she divorces Harry, she can keep her title. Now, she won't be known as the Duchess of Sussex, she'll be known as Meghan, Duchess of Sussex. But hey, Duchess of Sussex is still in the mix. And as a consequence, most people in the U.S. will really accord her whatever status, divorced, that they accorded her married. Furthermore, do you really think it's very likely that a U.S. court is going to give custody to two children under their jurisdiction to a parent who is going to move them overseas? You know, you'd have to have a lot of proof that they were unsafe in their present environment. But that is just human nature. I would expect the British courts to do the same thing in the case of divorce, where there are minor children. They will want to keep the children in their own country. That It's just the way people are. It's not to say the British think we are unfit parents, or we think the British are unfit parents. It's just, boy, once people have their hands on something, they just don't like to let go of it. I think she did just what it appears. She found the one area that will be the most favorable if she decides to divorce Harry and walk away with half his money and both his kids. So again, pure speculation. But keep in mind, that is the Diana with which she was obsessed. That is Diana from, what, 90, well, the, Charles and Diana separated in 93, and 92, I'm sorry, separated in 92. So that was the Diana for the last five years of her life. That was Diana when she when she was approaching her 30s going into you know, well actually she was in her 30s coming into her own that's the best way to put it that's the Diana Megan envies so where are we going from here that is the Diana 
who had the title, had the kids, had the money, and said goodbye to the husband she no longer wanted. And I would have to say, realistically speaking, this is how the pieces fit together and form a picture. This is the explanation that makes sense, that accounts for all of the strangeness and the variables that are otherwise not accounted for. The goal to go to California, um, to live this private life in one of the most public places on the planet. No, but it makes perfect sense if what she wants is an exit strategy. So, I guess when we say Mexit, meaning the exodus from the UK, it's only a small piece of it. I think the real Mexit is something we still have to look forward to, which is going to be her exit from the royal family, from her marriage with the kids, the title, the money, the fame, in the hopes of becoming Diana 2.0. So I guess only time will tell. I do think, however, this is the explanation that makes sense. This is the explanation that fits with everything we know about Nutmeg, with everything we know about Harry, with everything we know about what they've done so far. I think everything is leading up to that point. The inevitable, you know, divorce and big sweepstakes win. So, we'll see. All right. Next week, I am hoping to have some information on the quest for Lilibet. Uh, spoiler alert, I have not found the baby. No. No baby, not found. But I do have some interesting information for you. So, that is next week. Meantime, we will have our thrifting videos uh, over the weekend. And we are going to move out on a slideshow. So, oh, this slideshow. Our littlest subscriber. Um, this is Evelyn, who has been watching this channel since she was a tiny little baby. So I, I always enjoy the Evelyn slideshow. I hope you will too. I will see you all next time. Have a terrific day. <laughs>